Ben, you may be seated. We want to dismiss our kids for Kids Quest at this time, so kids, you're welcome to go. Well, good morning again. Good to see you here. I am glad to be here. Are you glad to be here? Yes. Amen. I want to pray this morning before we begin our time. I want to pray for a couple of things. Uh, many of us have been praying for David Beeger. David is over in Ukraine and Egypt, probably in Egypt at this point, I imagine, in his leg of, last leg of the journey. He'll be home soon, but we want to continue to lift him in prayer, and I felt it was important to make that public for us, to remind you to continue to pray for him daily, even often throughout the day if you can. Uh, not only is he in a dangerous part of the world, but he is doing very significant work, I think, of praise, raising up church leaders and instilling not only uh, an understanding of God's Word, but encouraging them to do the ministry God has called them to. So what a tremendous ministry. And we're looking forward, when he comes home, to hear about how that trip went. But we're going to pray, and we're going to cheer him on from this side of the continent over on the other side to pray for him. The other thing I want to ask you to pray for, too, as some of you have been familiar with this, uh, as a parent, suddenly it's funny how the Weather Channel becomes the most exciting bit of news to watch on TV. When your daughter is in Louisiana, right there in the middle of a hurricane, you want to know what's going on. I couldn't care less about the Weather Channel until suddenly I hear about a Hurricane Barry. So uh, we, let's just pray that uh, God would continue to dissipate that. It went from Hurricane 1 now to Tropical Storm, but they're still expecting severe winds and a great deal of rain as well. So let's pray for those things. Let's pray for our country as well, and let's pray for our time here today as we open God's Word. Will you pray with me? Father, we lift up David to you, and we thank you for not only placing in his heart a desire, but equipping him with the abilities uh, to strengthen and to edify uh, the people of God around the world, to strengthen the church and to grow the kingdom of God. And we pray, Lord, that right now that you would be with him in a very special way, that you would strengthen him, give him endurance, give him wisdom and give him courage and give him insight to know how to minister best to the leaders that you're raising up in these other countries that are expanding and deepening and doing the significant work of Christ. Father, we pray as well for this hurricane, uh, Barry. We pray that you'd continue to dissipate the winds. And Lord, we recognize that uh, all of us have loved ones around this country and around the world. So, Lord, we pray for all people that uh, you would spare and protect anyone from the damage or the danger that this uh, storm could bring about. And we ask that uh, they would continue to see an answer to prayer there and just your protection. And thank you, Lord, for how you've already protected them. And, Lord, we lift up our country to you. We live in a great nation, but we do not live in a perfect nation. And so, Father, we ask that you'd forgive the sins of this nation. We know that they are great. And we know that they are deep. Father, we ask that you'd have mercy on this nation as you have had in decades and hundreds of years in the past. Lord, would you continue to raise up leaders that love you, that, that want to honor you and do what is right. I pray that you'd protect this nation and the decisions that we make, that they would desire to honor you first and foremost. Be with our president, our vice president, and the governors and the various levels of of government in our country, Lord, that you would protect, sustain, and guide this nation to honor you. And Lord, we ask that you would as well give a heart in each one of them that desires to fear and honor you more than anything else. Now, Lord, we open your word, and we come to this time that we ask that you would strengthen the faith of each person here, that you would deepen the roots of our confidence in who you are, that you would remove the doubts that we may struggle with as we came in here today, and Lord, that we'd be refreshed, not just in our minds, but in our hearts, knowing that you are God, and there is no other, you, and you are the God of the Bible, and we can fully trust you. Now, Father, I pray, make our faith strong in you. Thank you, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Well, last week I ended with asking you or sharing with you that I wouldn't be a bit surprised in the week to come if someone asks you by divine appointment, by a convergence of circumstance, that God places you in the lives of someone who wants to know who God is or to hear about your testimony. 
Now, you may not like this, but I'm going to pray that God does that. If He hasn't yet, He will. And I can guarantee you that someone in the days to come very soon is going to ask you, why do you believe in God? Why do you believe in Jesus? Why do you believe in the Bible? And I want you to be prepared to be able to give an answer for your faith. You see, I recognize that every one of us struggle with doubts. I struggled severely with doubts in my early walk with Christ. I look back and I'm thankful for those doubts because they drove me to understand, is God real? Is the Bible God's word? Is Jesus Christ the only way, the life, and the truth? Only way to the Father? Is that true? Is Christianity true? I wrestled severely with those questions. I'm thankful now that I did. And you may have come here this morning wrestling with some doubts that are deep in your heart. If you have, you're not alone. Every one of us wrestle with questions Is God real? Is the Bible true? Is Jesus Christ really the way, the life, and the truth, the only way to the Father? There's not one single person that does not take their faith serious, that doesn't struggle with questions like that. And those are good questions. Doubt is not wrong. Disbelief is when you get into trouble. The Bible tells us this, that we are to be prepared to give an answer for our faith, that in fact it is the job of every Christian to be ready to give an answer. Peter says, always be ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you. Someone's going to ask you in the nearest future, and I want you to be prepared. So we've begun a series called Answering Faith's Hard Questions, and we're tackling some hard questions. Is God real? I intended to do one message on this particular topic, and I realized the more I began to unpack it, I thought, you know what, we can't do one message. We need to do three messages on this particular topic, and I think you'll find that uh, the answer of why I'm doing that here soon. I think we need to know why is God real in a way that not only satisfies our hearts and our minds, but also equips us and prepares us to be able to give an answer, that is what Peter said, to make a defense to everyone, that is to give an account for the hope that is in you. You see, I think that many people today have the rationale behind Christianity, about Christianity, that it's nothing more than like believing in fairies and leprechauns. That we've advanced so much in our reason and our technology and our science in the world today that, that faith and reason are two separate things. They are at animosity with one another. They're contradictory. So the question that I want to answer and satisfy for you in your own heart and mind is this. Is Christianity reasonable? Is there substantial evidence to say, not only can I believe in this, but it is the only right and reasonable thing to believe in Christianity? That's my goal over the next number of weeks. And the first question we tackled last week, who is Jesus Christ? Is He The only way in which we can be saved. How are you saved? Can you lose that salvation? And a number of other questions I want to tackle in the days to come. But this this morning I want to tackle, is God real? A second part of three parts of this question. And last week we looked at a couple of reasons that we can know that God is real. The first reason was a philosophical reason. Philosophically meaning this, that without God, life would not make sense. Life, in fact, would be absurd. You see, the Bible tells us that there is a longing inside of us that longs for something more than this life offers. And that is a strong hint inside of every person that points to God. In fact, Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11 Solomon, who is the wisest king that ever lived, said this, that God has placed eternity in the hearts of every person, but they do not understand it. We are aware of it, we live for it, we long for it, but we do not understand it. We cannot wrap our minds fully around it. Why? Because you were made to live forever, But we live in a sin-fallen world in which we see dimly now and we don't understand 
the eternity that God has planned for us. You see, I think it's that very sense of longing and awareness of eternity that the late Steve Jobs, the highly successful co-founder of Apple, major stockholder in Pixar, incredibly successful man, wrestled with this sense of eternity in his heart as he faced imminent death. He said this, It is strange to think that you accumulate all this experience and it just goes away. You see, many people believe today that when you die, that's all there is. The candle goes out and that's it. But the reality, if there was no God, then life would be meaningless. It would have no value. It would be absolutely absurd. And yet, the problem with that is every human heart wrestles with the fact that, no, there's got to be more. Steve Jobs said, it's strange to think that you accumulate all this experience and it just goes away. So, I really want to believe, he said, that something, something survives that maybe your consciousness endures. You hear what he's saying? He's saying, I hope there's something more. I really do. I hope there's something more. Otherwise, this life is a waste. You see, if God is not real, human life has no meaning, has no value. Late Francis Schaeffer said that if God is dead, then man is dead too. So all of our unfulfilled desires in our lives really point to God. So I gave you a moral, or pardon me, a philosophical reason. Second was a moral reason, and that is that our universal sense of right and wrong come from God. That just as there are fixed laws in our universe, talking about the gravitational pull, the rotation of the earth, the axis, etc., of the earth, the distance from the sun, just as there are fixed laws in our universe, so there are fixed moral laws in our universe. And just as those fixed laws in our universe allow life, so these fixed moral laws allow life as well. And these moral laws are universal. All of us know it is not right to steal, to murder, to lie, to, to, to commit adultery. Various rules that we know that are written on the very conscious of our hearts. Now, I know... And you know, there are those who will tell you today, you know what? Truth is what you want it to be. And there are no fixed moral laws of right and wrong. That maybe stealing is wrong for you, but it's not wrong for me. Maybe lying is wrong for you, but it's not wrong for me. So truth is relative to what I want it to be in my own experience. The problem is they're lying to themselves because they know that there is a fixed law that is written on their hearts. You know how they know that? Look at their reaction when somebody lies to them. Look at their reaction when somebody steals from them. Look at their reaction when injustice is done to them. Look at their reaction when somebody cuts them off at the intersection. Why that guy? Why did he do that? That's just relative to you. You see, the reality is we all know we have an innate awareness of right and wrong an absoluteness, and where'd that come from? Where'd these moral laws come from? They came from a moral law giver. When somebody does something wrong, what's the first thing to do when you're somebody's, if you have children, yeah, if you have children and you say, did you steal that? Did you just lie? Now, I know my kids never, they always said, yes, I just lied, or yes, I just stole that. But, you know, the average kid. <laughs> I know. So what happens when people are caught in a lie? What's the first thing they do? They don't even have to think about it. The first thing they do, I didn't lie. If it's not wrong, then why do you make excuses? Because you're revealing what the Bible says is that God's law is written on the conscience of every human being. Therefore, if there is a fixed moral law, there is a moral law giver. So this morning, I want to look at two more reasons why I believe not only is there a God, but there is substantial, overwhelming 
evidence that not only can we know this God, but we can trust this God and we can love this God with a safety and a joy and a security that satisfies our hearts. Two more reasons. One is what we call intelligent design. That is, the design of creation points to an ultimate creator or designer. And the second really is, is a, an extension of it, but I want to make them two separate ideas, and you'll see why in a moment. But one is intelligent design. The other is what's called the anthropic principle. Don't let that word throw you. It simply comes to the word anthropos, which means man. And what that idea says is this, is that God created the world in such a way for human life to survive. He put everything here, not only so we could survive, but we could thrive. So the anthropic principle simply says that God created the universe for human life to, to live. So first of all, human or intelligent design is the third reason I want us to look at. The design of creation points to an ultimate designer. Now let me tell you, you can't live in this part of the world or this part of the country and see a sunset or look at a sunrise. You can't look at a leaf or a flower or even a pine cone and not find yourself staggered inwardly going, wow, this is amazing. How did this come about? Hold a newborn baby in your arms and deny that there is a creator. You see, the world is filled with an amazing and wonderful complexity that leaves us stunned by not only its beauty, but the wonder of it all. And the Bible tells us this, that the heavens are telling of the glory. Now listen to this. And their expanse is declaring the work of His hands. What He's saying is that when we look at creation, the reason we are caught up in wonder and a sense of awe is because we're seeing the reflection of God. We're seeing the fingerprints of God in creation, and that leaves us with a sense of wonder and awe. I am amazed how many times I can walk down the same wooded trail, see the same scenery around me year in and year out and still be caught up in a sense of amazement and wonder and praise that, God, you created all of this and this points to you. The psalmist says that the heavens are telling of the glory of God and their expanse is declaring the work of His hands. We are seeing the handiwork of God. That's why we are so amazed but you see, if the world was not created by an ultimate designer, then that leaves us with only one other option. That you are a fluke, a cosmic fluke. I know, I'm not trying to insult you. I'm just trying to say that's what, what you're left with. That we were created by chance, random chance. You just kind of like there was nothing and... And there was something and that came out something beautiful. So, is that true? I know the sound effects aren't that great. But you won't forget it, will you? <laughs> so, what are the odds of all that we see in this complexity, its wonder, its majesty, its brilliance? What are the odds? What are the odds of that being by chance? Over the last number of years, scientists, as they have more and more knowledge and tools in which they're equipped with to examine creation have been staggered and stunned by the immensity and the wonder of the complexity of the world that we live in. And so you have men like Michael Denton and Michael Behe, names you're maybe not familiar with, that are now proponents of what is called intelligent design. Because as they look at the world around us, they see the complexity of all the design and the intricacy, not just that, the uniformity, and not just that, but the harmony that allows all of it to exist to sustain life. They are convinced that there has to be an intelligent designer. 
one of those guys by the name of Michael Denton did some research on the mathematical calculations, and he found the work of Roger Penrose, a mathematician out of Oxford. And Roger Penrose did the mathematical odds. What are the probability of odds, numerically speaking, in which all of this, there was nothing, literally nothing, nothing, and then suddenly there was, now I won't make that sound effect again for you because I don't want you to cringe like I saw you already cringe. But there was nothing, and all of a sudden there was something, and that something was a fluke of random chance. What are the mathematical odds of that happening? Denton writes, the calculations of Oxford mathematician Roger Penrose show the improbability of a universe conducive of life occurring by accident and luck and chance is, listen to this, just bear with me as I say these numbers. He's going to make more sense of them in a moment. It is one chance in 10 to the 10,123rd power. The phrase, quote, extremely unlikely, unquote, is inadequate to describe this possibility. It is hard to imagine, he says, this number, what this number means. In math, he says, he says 10 to the 123rd power is one with 123 zeros behind it. Now, just to kind of give you a, an estimate of what that looks like in terms of, of, our, of our world, he says this is more, that is 10 to the 123rd power, that is 1 with 123 zeros behind it. When you put that all together, he said that is more than the total atoms believed to exist in our entire universe. Now, that's just 10 to the 123rd. That is not 10 to the 10,123rd power. So he says this, but Penrose's answer is vastly more than simply one with 123 zeros. It is one followed by 10,123 zeros. And it is impossible, in other words, that this could have simply happened. Did I lose anybody yet? I'm lost. So did all this happen by chance? Well, mathematically speaking, the probability is impossible. Not only Michael Denton, but another fellow intelligent designer or thinker by the name of Michael Bay, he said this. He made this confession, he says, and this is referring back to before 2000. He says, it is a shock to us in the 20th century to discover from the observation of science is made that the fundamental mechanisms of life cannot be ascribed to natural selection. And therefore, we're de but, they were, but we're therefore designed. But, he says, we must deal with our shock as best we can and go on. What we're finding today is that more and more scientists who are saying, okay, let's just look at reason and let reason be our guide. What does reason tell us? Reason tells us, as we look at the evidence of creation around us, that there is phenomenal, intelligent design. But the Bible tells us this. Even though we look at creation, and it tells us that we know, for since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes, God's invisible attributes, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, still, men will say, there cannot be a God. Why? Because the Bible says that it's not only a, a physical reality we live in, but we also live in a spiritual reality, and that we are fallen human beings who are fallen victims to sin that has darkened our ability to see God or even to follow God or obey Him. And so we see brilliant minds, brilliant minds like Francis Crick, molecular biologist, biophysicist, neuroscientist, co-discoverer of the structure, the DNA molecule, men with brilliant minds, always learning, the Bible says. Listen to what he says, an honest man armed with all the knowledge of avail the available to us now could only state that in some sense, the origin of life appears at the moment to be almost a miracle. So many are the conditions which would have been, had to have been satisfied to get it going. And yet, he maintains, 
Biologists must constantly keep in mind that what they see is not designed, but rather evolved. <laughs> Always learning, but never coming to the knowledge of the truth, the Bible says. You see, we don't simply live in a physical world. We live in a spiritual world as well, in which men are darkened spiritually to see or to acknowledge that God is God. Another fellow evolutionist, Professor Richard Lewontin, who's a geneticist, evolutionist, brilliant man, says this, we have a prior commitment, a commitment to materialism. That is, the universe is all that there is. No matter how counterintuitive, no matter how mystifying to the uninitiated, materialism is absolute, for we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. Do you hear that? He says, we look at all that there is and we are drawn inwardly to say, wow, there's got to be a God out there who created all this. But no, we cannot allow a divine, divine foot in the door. To do so would, well, that'd be a humbling thing. We'd have to admit that there is a God in which we are accountable to, a God who created all that there is. One of my favorite Christian apologist Peter Kreeft said it this way. He used a couple of analogies to help put us in perspective of mathematically, as well as based on the evidence of the world, what is the probability of this simply happening by chance? He said someone once said that if you sat a million monkeys at a million typewriters for a million years, one of them would eventually type out Shakespeare's, all of Shakespeare's Hamlet by chance. <laughs> but when we find the text Hamlet, listen to what he says, but when we look at the text of Hamlet, we don't wonder whether it came from chance or monkeys. <laughs> when, why then does the atheist use the incredibly improbable explanation of the universe? Clearly, because that is his only chance of remaining an atheist. At this point, we need a psychological explanation of the atheist rather than a logical explanation of the universe. We have a logical explanation of the universe, but the atheist doesn't like it. It is called God. Another man by the name of John Leslie put it this way, and he gave us this analogy. He said, the odds of the world just kind of happening... Fluke, chance, random, you know. The odds of that happening, he said, would be the odds of a man who is sentenced to a firing squad and he has 50 expert riflemen in front of him and they're six feet away and they're all commanded to point at the man and shoot at the same time. He said the odds would be that scenario and they all fire at the same time, and yet every single one of them miss. You see, it does not make sense to look at the world and say, wow, chance is amazing. Maybe I'll win the lottery. But instead, when we look at creation, we go, wow, there is a creator. When we look at the design of creation, we recognize there's an ultimate designer. So that leaves us with one chance then, or one, one opportunity, and that is that we believe that the world is created by God. Paul says in Romans, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, divine nature, being clearly seen, be understood what has been made so that they are without excuse. It is fascinating that when you read Genesis chapter 1, it says that the world, that there was nothing, and then God spoke, and when there was nothing, and after he spoke, there was something. Theologians call that ex nihilo, that is from nothing, God created something, and voila, there was not just something. Listen to this, there was not just something, there was all of creation and life in its entirety and complexity and uniformity and harmony instantly. In other words, there was not the gradual 
modification of creatures evolving from one into the other, but rather there was nothing, and scientists as well as geologists and look at back at, at the world, and they say, this is true. This is what the evidence points to. There was absolutely nothing, and then you look at the fossils, and there was something, and that something was amazingly complex, was amazingly uniform, was amazingly harmonious. And you know what else is amazing? It has not changed. It has not changed. Take, for instance, the cheetah. The cheetah is the fastest land animal on earth. It is capable of achieving the speed of 40 miles per hour inside of two seconds. You ready? 1,001, 1,002. 40 miles an hour. Its top speed, 70 miles per hour, touching the ground maybe every 23 feet. Its unique lung capacity its incredible molecular structure and bone structure are designed precisely to allow this cheetah to be able to run at this incredible speed. This high-performance runner did not evolve this way, but rather was created this way instantly and has always been that way. All the fossil records of every cheetah going all the way back as far as they can go. The cheetah is the cheetah is the cheetah. They have a unique spine in which both the, the hips and the shoulders roll around the spine, allowing the, the fluidy movement of be able to attaining and sustaining the speeds that it does. And every fossil that they find of a cheetah finds that this high-performance animal was created that way instantly. Did not evolve that way, but has always been that way. Way. There were no series of random modifications. And they say that is not only true of the cheetah, but it is also true, listen to this, of the 9 million plus species on planet Earth. Every one of them were created instantly with the incredible complexity and abilities that they have that we still see at work today. Amazing, isn't it? No, there's no God. This all happened by chance. Anthony Flew, who was an atheist for 50 years, a proponent of atheism, he said this, Although I once sharply, was once sharply critical of the argument of design, I have since come to see that when correctly formatted, that is, information that put in the right context, this argument constitutes a persuasive case for the existence of God. In other words, open your eyes. All you have to do is look at creation and you recognize that there is a design, therefore there is ultimate designer. So there is intelligent design. The second argument that really sustains and demonstrates that God is real is what we call the anthropic principle. That is, our life-sustaining needs are met by a personal creator. These really are much the same argument. They come by different names. One of the names for this argument is called the teleological argument. That because there is design and intricacy in the world today, therefore telos, meaning that there is this idea of completion. The teleological argument says because there is completion and in, in, in complexity in the world, therefore God is. Another name for this is called the fine-tuning argument. But what's important, whether you call it intelligent design, anthropic principle, or whether you call it teleological or the fine-tuning, what is important about these arguments that I want you to be aware of is this, is that the most powerful and persuasive evidence, and you don't win anybody, by the way, to Christ through reason. It is a spiritual work in their heart that God does. God is the one who does regenerating, but we use reason to challenge the lies that people believe in that are clouding their vision from who God is. And so one of the most powerful proponents of evidence that points to God is this whole idea of intelligent design, of the fine-tuning argument, of the anthropic principle that God created the world in such a manner that life not only exists, but life thrives. And we're going to see the wonder of the, the 
connectedness of how big this is in just a moment. But this other, this other reason is called the anthropic principle. That we are here because God created the world in such a way that human life can be sustained. This whole question came about, that is the fine-tuning argument, the anthropic principle came about because physicists, as they came together, they're accumulating all their evidence, they asked this question, why does the universe operate, it, operate according to the laws that it does? In other words, physicists were looking at creation, they're going, you know what, there are a number of fixed laws that don't change, and what is amazing, if these laws even change by a thousandth or a hundredth of a thousandth, we would lose life and all of creation. Fixed laws such as the, the gravitational pull of the world, the rotation of the earth, the tilt on the axis, the distance from the sun, and on and on and on. What are called fixed laws or constants that allow life to be sustained here on earth. And they ask the question then, why does the universe operate according to the laws that it does? And they recognize that all of creation is not simply complex, but rather it is fine-tuned in precisely the right way that allows life to exist. Now, I want to take a moment and just expand your mind a little bit because you're probably thinking, yeah, that's planet Earth. But I want to expand your thinking and help you realize what they're really saying here. They are not saying that life on planet Earth is fine-tuned in such a way that allows human life to exist. What they're saying is this. They recognize that all of creation, that is the entire universe, has been put together. Now listen to this. The entire universe is what? The entire universe is 100 billion galaxies, is 100 trillion billion stars. And what they're saying is all of this is necessary in its exact place, exact size, exact rotation. Everything is necessary to sustain life right here on earth. It is all systemically connected to allow life to exist right here. In other words, one person put it this way, we live in a kind of Goldilocks universe, <laughs> in which conditions had to be just right for life to emerge and to thrive. And in fact, that's exactly what we see, is that life simply hasn't emerged, but life thrives here today. So this whole argument is considered to be one of the strongest evidences for the existence of God outside of Jesus Christ, outside of the Bible. Just creation itself. That's why Paul began in Romans chapter 1 saying, just look around us. And he more than says that. He says, listen, if you look at creation, that is enough evidence that God is in such a way that if you reject that, you're rejecting God for all eternity. So God created the world to meet our needs. But as we begin to explore this, we begin to realize that God simply did not create the world to meet our needs. He created the world to meet our needs, and He went to incredible, incredible distances to meet our needs personally. So I want to examine some of the ways that God meets our needs. Four, in fact, as we walk through this. How does God meet our needs? Well, first of all, He provides food. Now, when I was leaving the house this morning, I fed my dog, and I fed her dog food. And she's had the same dog food last night, yesterday, and the day before, and the day before that, and the day before that, and the day before that, the same food. And you know what? She enjoys it every time. But what is fascinating is that God created the world in such a way that it not only satisfies our hunger, but He satisfies it in a way that we take delight in what we eat. I mean, there is nothing like sitting down after a long day to a, a thick, mouth-watering steak, mm. mashed potatoes, oh, and then to cap it all off with a thick slice of cherry pie, vanilla ice cream. <laughs> I didn't hear that. Yeah. 
So God meets our needs in such a way that not only are we sustained, but we are, we are delightfully satisfied when he does. We thirst, and so God provides water to quench our thirst. How many times have you worked on a hot, long day, and you took a, a long drink of cool, clear water, and it satisfies your thirst. It quenches it in an amazing way. God created it to satisfy your needs. The Bible says this, Then God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of the earth and every tree which has fruit yielding seed. It shall be food for you. And every beast of the earth and every bird of the sky and everything that moves on the earth which has life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. Later in Genesis chapter 6, he tells us then that we are able to meet, eat meat. But all of this is given to us to satisfy our hunger. He not only satisfies our hunger, but he also satisfies our need for relationship. He, le- he heals our loneliness. You see, you and I were made for relationship. So in the beginning, you find God creates Adam, and the one thing that he says is not good in the Garden of Eden before he is completed with it, the one thing that is not good, even though it is perfect, he says the one thing that is not good is it is not good for man to be alone. And so he created Eve, and he created marriage. Why? Because we long for fulfilled relationships, but we also need relationships outside of marriage, and God provides for those. Psalm 68, verse 6 says this, God makes a home for the lonely. God does not want you to be lonely. Some of you came here lonely. And yet God has provided relationships in your life that have deeply enriched, have made your life far more fulfilling. Because God does not want you to be lonely. He makes a home for the lonely. That's why a church family is so important. Fellow believers in Christ are so important for one another. Patrick Morley, who developed what is called Man in the Mirror Ministries years ago, said that men need three things. He said if they have these three things, it will satisfy or take care of 90% of their problems. He said, the first thing that every man needs is the Bible. The second thing they need is a small group. The third thing they need is a service. Bible, small group, and a service. I want you to notice what all three of those have in common. They all three have relationship in common. First of all, Bible is your relationship with God. Until you have a relationship with God, life is not going to make sense. Life will never be fulfilling. Not only this life, but the life to come. Everyone should have a Bible the Word of God, and a relationship with God. They need to have a small group where they're able to relate with fellow men at the same level to grow as iron sharpens iron, to grow in their faith. And they need to have a service where they're helping others who are in need. I believe he's right. That not only does God provide for us, but he also uses us as a tool to provide for the needs in other people's lives as well. He heals our loneliness. He offers forgiveness and acceptance. I find this amazing because all of us have regrets, don't we? All of us have things we've messed up in our lives. We need forgiveness, we need acceptance, and we need primarily God's forgiveness and God's acceptance. Now, here's what I find that is so absolutely amazing about the anthropic principle. The anthropic principle says that God has provided a universe that sustains our needs and meets human life's needs. But the anthropic principle, he goes further than that. Listen, do we deserve forgiveness? Do we deserve God to accept us in our rebellion against him? And yet God says, I know you don't deserve this, but uh, you have need of something deeper than physical sustenance of life. You have need of spiritual healing. And you need to know forgiveness. You need to know acceptance. You see, God knows we need more than a creator. We need a savior, 
a redeemer. And the Bible says this, that Christ redeemed us from the, cure of, from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. This verse is saying this, that Jesus Christ took our punishment. He took our sin, in which we deserve to be punished for, rejected by God. He took that on, on the cross, on our behalf. He suffered our punishment so we can be forgiven. But how do you do that? The Bible says this in Romans chapter 3, verse 22, we are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. You see, Christianity is not for good people. Christianity is for people who recognize their need for forgiveness. People who recognize that they need a Savior. That's what Christianity is about. But you see, there's more than that. God not only provides for us for the forgiveness that we long for, and by the way, that forgiveness is unconditional. It is unconditional. Unconditional. Would you say that word with me? Unconditional. What does the word unconditional mean? It means unconditional. It means this, that when God forgives you, it is done. He's not going to throw it in your face ever again and say, do you remember in 1996 when? Do you remember in 2005 when? And you go, but, but God, I thought, I, thought, I, thought we, I thought we settled that. God's never going to do that. You're forgiven and it's gone. We read it this morning, Psalm 103, verse 12. As far as the east from the west, so he's removed our sins from us. But you see, he more than just gives us forgiveness. He also gives us acceptance. And not just acceptance, which is also unconditional, but listen carefully. He allows us to have self-acceptance as well. You see, given the option, I think every one of us, and I, I, maybe I'm just speaking for myself, but I don't think so. I think given the option, every one of us would say, you know, I'd like to have a different body. I'd like to have a different face. I'd like to have a different personality. You see, I think most people are not comfortable in their own skin. Am I the only one speaking here? I think most of us are not. You know, it's interesting. In America, the thing is to be tan. Got to be tan. Tan is in. And then you go to a place like India where everybody is tan and white is in. Everybody wants to be white. Why is that? Because given the option, we would be different from what we are because we're not comfortable in our own skin. It's the weirdest thing. Why is that? Because we're fallen beings. Because we know that we need not merely forgiveness, but we need acceptance. And we long not only for God's acceptance, but we long to be able to accept ourselves the way God has put us together. But here's the deal. If we have God's acceptance, do you know what that means? It means you can accept yourself. If you have God's forgiveness, do you know what that means? It means you can forgive yourself. In fact, the Bible says this. It gets very scientific here. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, that if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation, build all things have become old, and all things, old things have gone, but all things have become new. This word creation right there means a new kind of species that never existed before. And that new kind of species is a new person. That's what you become as a new person who's completely accepted unconditionally by God and completely and unconditionally forgiven by God. And what that means by inference then is that you can completely accept yourself. Now, I want to take this a step further because you're not convinced. I can see it on your faces. If the same creator... who designed the universe with its 100 billion galaxies, 100 trillion billion stars, over 9 million species, created all of this with simply the spoken word instantly in six days, 
one after the other. And all of it is not only incredibly complex, it is uniform, it is harmonious. It is governed in such a way that it allows life to exist and everything has a purpose, everything has a place, every size, every location, every kind of planet, of species has a purpose. Now just supposing that God took you, he made you as tall or as short as wide or as thin or as in between or whatever. He gave you the color of eyes. He gave you the color of hair. He gave you the face. He gave you the voice. He gave you all of that because that is part of his infinite, complex, marvelous, glorifying design that is all designed to come together to work in perfect harmony. What if? God made you because he wanted to be exactly like you are to fill his purposes that are bigger than you can comprehend. The year was 1930. The lady was 28 years old. She stood four foot, four feet, ten inches. She had incredibly dark hair incredibly dark eyes. In all her life growing up, she wondered as she sat in the classroom, why is it that I have dark hair and dark eyes and I'm so short when all the people around me are tall and have blonde hair? Why can't I be like them? And she asked God this question. But at 28 years of age, she began to realize the answer. She boarded a boat in 1930 and sailed for China, where everybody has dark hair, dark eyes, and is short. She was rejected as a missionary by different missionary organizations because she was uneducated, didn't meet their standards. Finally, she wrote a letter to a woman who was helping over there. She said, I'll come and be your assistant. Will you let me do that? And she did. She said, yes, come. She went to China as she was walking the broken, destitute streets of China, she saw children that were suffering, being sold, hungry, in need. And she began an orphanage. The lady who had invited her over died. Before long, she had a hundred children in this orphanage. And then war broke out over China. And she knew she had to get these children to safety. She risked her life making a 12-day journey over the rugged mountains of China to free China to save these hundred children. Her name was Gladys Elwood. She no longer wondered, why, God, did you make me the way you did? Now I know. You made me because you had a mission for me. Could it be? that God made you just the way you are because he has a purpose that is bigger than you could ever comprehend. And if you simply submit to his will and that purpose, not only will you be comfortable in your own skin, but you'll glorify God in that because you realize this is my niche. This is why I was made. Could it be? What would it be like if you could just say to yourself, you know, self, relax. Self, be comfortable in your own skin. Self, you have God's forgiveness. Self, you have God's acceptance. Self, get over yourself. He offers us forgiveness and acceptance through his Son. How else does he meet your needs? Above and beyond, he overcomes death and its fear. 
Not only does he meet our needs in this life, but he also meets our needs in death as well. Listen to what the author of Hebrews says. Because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood, the Son also became flesh and blood. For only as a human being could he die, and only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. Only in this way could he set free all who lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. What is this verse saying? It's saying that Jesus Christ came, God incarnate, and he not only provided forgiveness, he not only provided acceptance, but he provided, he provided the, the ability to conquer our greatest fear, our fear of death. But I want you to notice something this verse says very carefully, because if you miss this, you're going to really miss it. Because God's children. Not everyone who conquers the fear of death, or I should say not everyone has, will be able to conquer the fear of death unless they are God's children. And so the question is, how do you become a child of God? How do you enter into this forgiven and accepted relationship as a child of God? John says this in John chapter 1, verse 12, But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become, listen to this, children of God. How? Because they received him. They believed in him. Even those who believe in his name. In other words, we are not children of God because we are baptized, because we tithe, or because we promise to go to church, or because we promise to be as good as we can possibly good, be good and never mess up again. If you had to be perfect, you would never make it. Remember, Jesus didn't come here for perfect people. He came here for imperfect people. Christianity is not for good people. It's for people who recognize they're not good enough. And so those who become children of God are those who place their faith in Christ. That's it. So God has made it so simple for us that we simply place our trust in him and say, Jesus, you are my savior. You are my creator. You are my redeemer. I have no other hope but you. It is by faith alone. That's how you become a child of God. And your greatest need, our greatest need, by the way, when we look at the anthropic principle, our greatest need is our need for a redeemer. When Christ came and God created, he thought of everything, didn't he? You see, when God came to earth in the form of a son, He came so that we could know him, relate to God personally. Not only is God real, but God wants to have a real relationship with us. And that's why Christ came. That's why Christ died on the cross. That's why he was buried. That's why he rose again from the grave to conquer our fear of death. You see, there's going to be a moment in your life and my life when you're going to breathe that final breath. Your heart is going to make that final beat. And you're going to leave this world. And you're going to die. And the Bible tells us that when we come to Christ, we are not alone in our death. That he's already gone before us. He conquered death for us on the cross. He proved it by being raised from the grave on the third day. When that moment comes, what God is saying by placing our faith in Christ is that when we are absent from the body, we are present with the Lord. The moment, even before your eyes close, that heart stops beating, God says, I will be with you. And just as I walked with you all your life, and I said, I will never leave you nor forsake you, so nor will I leave you nor forsake you at this moment of death. And therefore, you can overcome even the fear of death itself because he overcame it for us. You see, some of you have been thinking about trusting Christ. And maybe you haven't crossed that line of faith. You've been thinking about it for weeks, maybe months, even years. Maybe you thought you were a believer. But God is doing a work in your life, and you realize, you know what? I have not personally entered into a relationship with God. I have not personally asked Him to forgive me for my sins. I've been banking on doing all the good things. I mean, after all, I've been in church. Look how long I've been in church. 
Look how much money I've given or how many good things I've done. God says, that's not going to cut it. Some of you have been holding back. What are you waiting for? What more does he have to show you that he's real? That he loves you? He cares for you? So much so that you're worth a son to him. What more does he need to show you? I want to invite you to pray with me right now. Not only do I want you to be clear in your own mind if you've crossed that line of faith, but I want you to think about others. Remember I told you that God is going to, by divine invitation, create a convergence of circumstance in which God is going to put people in your life in the days to come and say, why is it you're a believer? And rather than being like a deer in the headlights with a vacant, detached stare in your eyes and your mind going blank, I want you to say, let me tell you why. Let me tell you why. Will you pray with me? This morning, if you have never trusted Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you've been thinking about it for a long time, but God is saying now is that time. Would you pray this simple prayer? God made it so easy. Would you simply say, Lord Jesus, I want to put my trust in you as my Savior. I believe that your word is true, that you died on the cross for my sins. I believe that your word is true, that you love me more and forgive me more and accept me more than I could ever understand unconditionally. I give my life to you, Lord, and ask, show me what it means to live in obedient relationship with you. That as I look at the world around me, I will see not just simply the fingerprints of God, but be aware of the presence of God everywhere I look, knowing that you are with me and you'll never leave me nor forsake me. Thank you, Jesus. I pray this in your strong name. Amen. You'd stand and sing our last song is Show Me Your Ways.